It's October again, and that means it's time to continue my self-imposed tradition of spotlighting another horror anthology series. And diehard fans know that horror anthology series don't get much more fun than HBO's Tales from the Crypt. Much like the Creepshow movies before it, and like the Creepshow TV series after it, this TV series brought the gloriously pulpy spirit of the 1950s EC horror comics from the page to the screen, with almost every single episode straight up adapting stories from not only Tales from the Crypt, but also The Vault of Horror, The Haunt of Fear, Shock Suspense Stories, and others. And as if to give a big, bony, retroactive middle finger to the Comics Code Authority that infamously used to censor all quote-unquote inappropriate material in comics like depictions of supernatural monsters, using no-no words like horror or terror, or not making sure Batman and Robin were as unambiguously straight as possible, the Tales from the Crypt TV series took full advantage of its freedom as an adult program airing on HBO, relishing how much explicit violence, nudity, foul language, and dark, twisted storytelling they could possibly treat us to. It's irreverent, cheap thrills for the most part, rather than anything particularly thought-provoking or having much emotional substance like the best Twilight Zone or Outer Limits stories, but it's as damn entertaining, unapologetic, and well-produced as irreverent, cheap thrills can get with a plethora of talented Hollywood A-listers both in front of and behind the camera. Producers and directors like Robert Zemeckis and Richard Donner, composers like Alan Silvestri, James Horner, and Danny Elfman, and way, way too many recognizable actors to list in this intro. I'll name plenty of names later. With its glorious, Gorious production values, delightfully over-the-top acting, and just my kind of morbid sense of humor, not just in the stories themselves, but from our iconic host, the Crypt Keeper, who can make the cringiest of horror-related puns somehow wonderful and endearing, Tales from the Crypt is pulpy, macabre goodness that reliably scratches the same kind of itch for horror-loving audiences that I imagine the original EC comics did for readers way back in the 1950s. And for this Halloween season, I'm going to talk about a bunch of my favorite episodes. Insert standard disclaimer about how these are just my opinions, my tastes, by no means objectively the best episodes or the only right order to rank them in, etc, etc. Your favorites are most likely very different, and as always, I encourage you to share your own thoughts in the comments. Now, gather round, boils, ghouls, and every scare in between. These are my top 13 favorite episodes of Tales from the Crypt. Number 13. Fitting Punishment A recently orphaned teenager comes to live with his uncle Ezra, a funeral home director who's so stingy, compassionless, and cruel that even Ebenezer Scrooge would call him a monster. Dude routinely steals gold teeth out of corpses' mouths, somehow gets away with embalming bodies with dirty water because he can't be bothered to pay for real embalming fluid and is always verbally and eventually physically abusive to his poor nephew. You feel so sorry for this kid who has nowhere else to go and tries better than most to take all the terrible treatment in stride. Seems like as long as he has his Air Jordan shoes, his basketball, and his life, he can endure anything. Unfortunately, well, to compare the two characters again, as cheap and callous as Scrooge could be, at least he didn't cripple and kill Tiny Tim personally and then dismember his body to make it fit in an undersized coffin. This is pretty much everything you think of when it comes to typical Tales from the Crypt story. A tone that's equal parts tongue-in-cheek and horrific, a hammy, thoroughly irredeemable villain who you just love to hate, and some gleefully gory comeuppance at the end, showing that some people really do only learn their lesson when the shoe is on the other foot. Number 12. Yellow. I'm probably going to get some shit for placing this one so low on the list, especially since many consider this to be the best episode by leaps and bounds. It certainly is one of the most notable. It's by far the longest at almost 40 minutes. It has Robert Zemeckis himself directing, Alan Silvestri composing, several big name actors, and the overall presentation is easily the most strikingly cinematic in the entire series. It also stands out for having no real horror elements whatsoever other than the proverbial horrors of war, I guess. None of the supernatural hijinks or pulpy horror comedy that we normally associate with this show, but rather its tone and performances make it more of a straightforward period drama. 
and it's a pretty good straightforward period drama. But I watch Tales from the Crypt for the supernatural hijinks and pulpy horror comedy stuff. Even some of the other favorites on my list that take themselves a bit more seriously than others still absolutely feel like they belong in a horror anthology. But while Yellow feels a bit out of place in that regard, I do enjoy it for what it is enough that I ultimately couldn't not put it on the list. It takes place during World War II and stars real-life father and son Kirk Douglas and Eric Douglas as a hard-ass general and his son serving under him, respectively. While the general is a decorated, steadfast soldier who always puts duty and the good of the mission above all else, his son never wanted any part of this war, and all the prolonged brutality, death, and terror have taken such a toll on him that eventually lives are lost under his watch. For his supposed negligence and cowardice in face of the enemy, he's sentenced to the firing squad by his own father. After trying in vain his whole life to meet his father's expectations, and now that said life's about to be cut short anyway, he finally gives his old man a piece of his mind. Can I let you in on a little secret, General? You were not much of a father. That is what I'm really guilty of, isn't it, father? Huh? That the whole world knows that the son of the great General Calthrop is afraid to die. It's the strong performances from the two Douglases that really make this episode. The fact that the actors are a real father and son making it feel all the more authentic and raw from when they argue to when they have a heart-to-heart. Yellow is an atypical, riveting, visceral wartime drama about family versus duty that may at times make you forget you're not watching a full-fledged movie. And while I said it's not a horror story like the others, the ending does deliver arguably one of the darker twists in the series. Number 11. Carrion Death. Kyle MacLachlan plays a murderer who's escaped death row and is trying to make it to the Mexican border, but a very persistent policeman is in hot pursuit. The first half or so is a pretty solid game of cat and mouse, starting with a car chase and then forcing the two on foot, with the criminal trying every little trick he can to outrun or outwit the cop. But when the cop finally catches up, he's killed in their struggle right after he cuffs the two of them together and swallows the key. Well shit, now not only does McLaughlin have to carry the rest of the episode on his own, but he also has to carry the corpse of his enemy while crossing miles of scorching desert on foot with no food or water. And you really do feel how draining and disorienting a trek through such a desolate, harsh environment would be. The guy does have a decent sense of humor about his predicament, though. <sighs> Grab that for me, will you? <laughs> Women. Oh, can't live with them. Can't fit more than one in a trunk at a time. Wanna dance? Not a lot more I can say without spoiling too much. I just love this episode for its simple premise, its morbid laughs, and of course for just how beautifully ironic and gory its ending is. I've heard of double acts where one guy thinks his co-star is dead weight, but yikes. Number 10. For crying out loud. No ghoulies or goblins in this one either, and there's barely any real scares or bloodshed. But like Carrie and Death, it's just such a beautifully simple premise executed to such entertaining effect. A sleazy rock concert producer named Marty Slash has been having hearing problems lately, and his doctor advises him to get out of the rock and roll business before he goes totally deaf. And Marty, in fact, actually has a plan to retire early and rich. He uses a big concert, featuring the real-life Iggy Pop, to raise a million dollars for charity, but he actually plans to keep the money for himself and quickly flee the country before anyone notices the scam he pulled. However, it turns out one of those hearing problems Marty's been having, strange inner ear noises, was the literal voice of his conscience, which is now speaking up loud enough for him to properly hear it chastising him for what he's doing. To make matters worse, his sexy banker has caught on to his scheme and tries to blackmail him out of half of the dough. So he beats her to death with a guitar and hides her body in a drum case. Yep, just keep on piling up reasons for that conscience to nag at you, Marty boy. And to make matters worse-er, a police officer pays him a visit due to noise complaints. And from here on, it's a bit of a modern telltale heart situation. 
except instead of the protagonist's guilt and anxiety over what he's done manifesting in the sound of a dead man's heart beating louder and louder to suspenseful effect, it's an actual voice in his head taunting and badgering him to do the right thing louder and louder to hilarious effect. In a series where so many main characters wind up bringing twistedly ironic fates onto themselves because they have little to no conscience, you gotta love how they made a story where actually having a conscience is the real horror for a character who's desperately trying to do wrong and get away with it. It's such a hoot watching Marty go nuts as he tries to shut the voice in his head up and digging his own grave deeper and deeper until the pressure of it all just becomes too much. This being Tales from the Crypt, I wouldn't have been surprised if they had the guy's head literally explode at the end. And while the actual twist is nothing quite as amazing as that would have been, it's still a great payoff in its own way. Number 9. The Ventriloquist Dummy The idea of inanimate dummies, puppets, mannequins, children's toys, etc. turning out to be alive and murderous is its own horror subgenre by now, and one that I personally have never been all that into. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy Talkie Tina, Chucky, Megan, and the dolls from... Dolls. And I do get how uniquely scary the concept can be. It's just me and my personal interests. When I'm scrolling through a bunch of different types of scary stories to watch, my general reflex toward these stories tends to be... Eh, you've seen one of those, you've seen them all. But this one stands out as one of my favorites of this show, largely because it has its own awesome take on the idea of a living killer puppet. It's twisted and gross and bonkers, and I fucking love it. It's about an aspiring ventriloquist meeting his lifelong idol, one of the greatest in the business, though nowadays the guy's pretty washed up, reclusive, and bitter. The younger guy just wants this master of the craft to come and watch his act, and be the one to let him know if he's got what it takes to be a great ventriloquist too. Turns out, no, he really, really doesn't. However, the older guy doesn't actually have much room to talk down since it's soon revealed he was never the real talent behind his act. His dummy, Morty, was. But it's not the little artificial person brought to life by magic or mad science scenario that you might expect. Instead, he has a deformed and homicidal conjoined twin on his arm, who's not too happy about this guy learning their secret. What was shaping up to be a basic never-meet-your-heroes story becomes a bloody, demented horror comedy reminiscent of movies like Evil Dead 2 or Beetlejuice. It's a memorable episode for having a sympathetic protagonist that we actually feel sorry for at times, for how wild and gruesome those last few minutes are, and of course, for everything about Little Morty. From his disgusting design, to his jarring Saturday morning cartoon voice, to his sadistic sense of humor, this little dude was born to be in the spotlight. A true talent that anybody in showbiz would surely give their right hand to do a collab with. Number 8. Top Billing. This one stars John Lovitz, who I know best from comedy roles like SNL, The Simpsons, and The Critic. So while it doesn't feel like it was necessarily scripted to be more comical than most episodes in an already pretty tongue-in-cheek show, his performance and chemistry with the rest of the cast do make this easily one of the funniest episodes for me, and make the truly shocking, horrific, and cruel ending all the more unforgettable. Lovitz plays a down-on-his-luck actor who can't get a gig because he doesn't have the conventional good looks all the producers want. He's been so unsuccessful for so long that all on the same day, his agent cuts ties with him, his girlfriend dumps him for a more studly neighbor guy, and he gets evicted from his apartment. He even happens to run into a more handsome, more successful actor he used to be friends with, played by Bruce Boxleitner, who gives him some friendly, blunt advice that acting is just another doggy dog business that nobody without the natural looks and or more practical attitude will ever get far in. Lovitz, however, insists that acting is an art that he, a true thespian, takes far more seriously. He's certain that he could turn his career around if somebody would just give him a chance to prove his talent. He soon gets that chance when he finds a performance of Hamlet, directed oh so zanily and hamily by none other than John Astin, aka the original Gomez Adams, and his play desperately needs someone to fill an essential role. But wouldn't you know it, Boxleitner also shows up to the audition and easily gets the part instead. Lovitz decides he's had enough of this guy and handsome actors like him hogging the spotlight and rubbing it in his face, 
so he kills him to steal the role of a lifetime for himself. But turns out this play isn't exactly being held in a normal theater, and the big role he landed is not the lead, Hamlet, but another iconic part that luckily a not-so-conventionally handsome actor like him won't be needing his face for. Number 7. Horror in the Night With a title like that, naturally our story begins in broad daylight. Or what passes for daylight in the murky, overcast skies of the UK where the show's production had moved for the seventh and final season. After two crooks rob a jeweler, one of them turns on and shoots his partner with the intent of making off with the jewels, only for the other guy to turn on and shoot him right back and actually make off with the jewels. He hides at an already kinda spooky hotel that gets much, much spookier as the night goes on. The receptionist seems vaguely familiar, though he can't remember from where or when. There's a sexy and mysterious woman who seems to know way too much about him and what he's doing here. And worst of all, he keeps seeing shocking, terrible things, like a guy suddenly bursting through the door and shooting him, only to abruptly wake up in bed as if he just got to the room. Or seeing the walls and ceiling oozing horrible torrents of blood, only to abruptly wake up in bed as if he just got to the room. Or seeing his mysterious new lady friend morphing into an unspeakable, nightmarish bloodsucker during casual sex instead of after marriage like normal. Only to abruptly wake up in bed as if he just... you get the idea. I know season 7 isn't exactly a fan favorite, but this episode is a real standout if you, like me, love haunted house stories dripping in macabre, creeping atmosphere that just get more bizarre and tense throughout, but also leave just enough room for doubt about how supernatural any of it really was by the end. In this case, maybe the guy was just having feverish hallucinations due to his bullet wound. Or maybe he was cracking under the weight of his paranoia, knowing he'll always be on the run from both the law and the criminal boss he betrayed. Or maybe if it scares like a haunting, seduces like a haunting, and delivers karmic justice like a haunting, it's a real goddamn haunting. The choice in the end is ours. Number 6. Television Terror This one stars Morton Downey Jr., who also starred in the Monsters episode of Face for Radio, which I talked about a couple years ago in that Top 13 video. I probably should have mentioned that at the time, though this actually aired a year before the Monsters episode did. Instead of playing a sleazy radio show host who takes advantage of his female co-workers, gets off on having the power to make audiences believe whatever he tells them to believe, and is a total vulture who profits off of the sensationalized stories of others. Here, he's playing a sleazy live documentary show host who takes advantage of his female co-workers, gets off on having the power to make audiences believe whatever he tells them to believe, and is a total vulture who profits off the sensationalized stories of others. Typecasting, or Morton Downey Jr. just playing himself? You decide. Much like living killer doll stories, found footage horror is another subgenre that I can appreciate the appeal of and have seen some great examples of, but is generally not one of my personal favorites. But haunted house horror most certainly is a favorite of mine, and the handheld, up close, kind of proto found footage style used throughout a good chunk of this episode really does complement the haunted house shenanigans and gives a real time, close quarters atmosphere that certainly stands out in this series. Downey and his cameraman explore an abandoned house where a woman horribly murdered her whole family, and to cater to the audience, he really plays up how haunted the place supposedly is, even bringing in a so-called psychic to give the local ghost stories some credibility. It's really all about the ratings, though, and this guy couldn't care less how much abusing his crew or bullshitting his audience he has to do for his show to succeed. An attitude that ultimately turns against him when the supernatural horrors of the house prove all too real, all too violent, and all too entertaining. So, of course, the crew he was always such an asshole to aren't in any hurry to get him out of there. They'd be cutting the highest rated show they've ever had short. As they say, the show must go on. Even when, or perhaps in this case, especially when, the star of said show is screaming bloody murder. Number 5. People Who Live in Brass Hearses Is there any horror movie or series that can't be instantly improved with more Brad Dorif? I think not. 
He's probably best known to horror fans as the voice of Chucky, as the Gemini killer in Exorcist 3, and as the sheriff in Rob Zombie's Halloween films. Hey, I said Dorif instantly improves a film, not that he makes a bad one good. But the part he plays here is somewhat more sympathetic and tragic, while still being plenty fun to watch. Dorif plays the slow, simple-minded brother of Bill Paxton's character, a scuzzy crook with a bad temper who's very domineering, manipulative, and borderline abusive of his little bro, clearly because it's such an easy way to make himself feel like a smarter, more impressive person than he really is. Dude isn't even a particularly successful criminal, having just gotten out of prison after he was ratted out for stealing by the local ice cream truck driver. Now that he's out, Paxton hatches a plan to get back at said ice cream man, while also making a big score at the expense of his former and his brother's current boss, who's just bitchy and detestable enough in her own right to make you kinda root for these bumbling crooks over her. Dorif, being such a loyal, eager-to-please little brother, plays a vital part in this plan, but his limited smarts and restraint when it comes to violence wind up bloodily complicating things, botching the job, and forcing Paxton to take more drastic, more direct measures against their ice cream peddling nemesis. What they find at the guy's home is one of the grossest, most shocking, cleverly set up, and perversely funny twist endings in the series. Paxton and Dorif do a terrific job as this dysfunctional, dubious, down-and-out pair of brothers who are stuck with one another for better and for worse, both being each other's closest confidant and each other's most damning liability in their own different ways. Their dynamic feels genuinely harsh and disheartening at times, but in a tragically believable way compared to most of the other over-the-top shitty relationships in this series. People Who Live in Brass Hearses treats us to one of the most memorable lead duos in the show, and with its depiction of blazing summertime neighborhoods, chilly ice cream trucks, and delightfully bloody twists and turns, this tale is truly hot, cold, and dead all over. Number 4. What's Cookin'? This is one of the more popular episodes, and not just because it happens to star Superman himself, Christopher Reeve, but because it really is Tales from the Crypt in top form. Reeve and Bess Armstrong play the husband and wife owners of a restaurant who apparently somehow expected to succeed with an all-squid menu. Instead, business is so bad that their asshole landlord, played by Meatloaf, is getting ready to evict them, much to Reeve's chagrin. However, just in their hour of need, Gaston, a drifter who's been cleaning the place for chump change, winds up unexpectedly saving the business with his secret barbecue steak recipe. It's an immediate smash hit with customers, the wife is optimistic about their prospects for the first time in who knows how long, and Gaston seems so humble, unassuming, and genuinely helpful. But Reeve is suspicious and quickly uncovers what the secret ingredient is. Hey, what's cooking, good lo- <laughs> Turns out the secret to making great steak is meatloaf. Or at least until this particular stock runs out and Gaston has to go out and kill someone else to keep up supply and demand. Yes, it's a very Sweeney Todd situation. And soon, this not-so-innocent friend of the family business easily blackmails his way into a sizable share of the profits as the restaurant at long last skyrockets to success. Eventually, though, it seems the police are getting a bit too hot on the trail, and Gaston concocts a plan to cut out the original ma and pa of this business, leaving only himself to inherit it all. But he may have underestimated this couple and the taste that they and their best customers have acquired for the kind of cuisine he introduced, not to mention all the money in it for those willing to trim the fat when need be. I just love the perfectly executed sense of humor this episode has about itself right from the get-go. Honey. If you bury that thing in the back of my neck, you're just gonna wreck the blade. It's a real expensive cleaver. They don't make them anymore. The great performances, some grisly visuals, how wholesome, cozy, and endearing the main setting and characters feel most of the time, even after we know the twisted truth of what's really keeping the business afloat, it's all stirred together to make a tale that's rightfully remembered as one of the juiciest dishes of the series. Number 3 the New Arrival David Warner plays a child psychologist who hosts a radio show where he gives advice to parents dealing with difficult children. 
One mother in particular, played by Zelda Rubenstein, has been calling over and over for help with her daughter Felicity, and while Warner has been rather dickishly dismissive of her, ratings are in the toilet and the management is preparing to cancel his show, so he decides to attract renewed interest by paying Rubenstein's home a special visit and working his psychological magic on Felicity in person. But from the moment the psychologist, his assistant, and their overbearing boss arrive at said home, things are already more than a little... off. Lots of strange junk littered all over the property, electrocuting doorknobs, Rubenstein herself coming off as friendly enough outwardly, but strangely dissonant with the world outside her house. She's collected countless books by other renowned psychologists, and insists they're all clueless quacks, and she claims with a completely straight face that she's eagerly expecting Felicity's father to return from fighting in World War II soon, despite how this is clearly the 1990s. And then there's the supposed problem child herself, Felicity, who makes horrible, guttural, downright monstrous sounds from upstairs when she wants attention from Mommy, and later scurries around the dark halls wearing a creepy, expressionless mask, taunting, separating, and trapping their visitors one by one. And the more that Warner and company discover about the true, disturbing nature of what Felicity, her mother, and the increasingly threatening nooks and crannies of their house really are, and what their hosts ultimately have in store for them, the more Warner's initial slogan, Good Psychology Beats Bad Behavior, is put to a grueling test. Is there a Norman Bates and his mother type of complex going on here, but in reverse? Or maybe more of a Jason Voorhees and his mother situation? Maybe even some proto-jigsaw elements here and there? Well, I dare not spoil the ending for those who haven't seen this one, but even an accomplished psychologist like Warner's character couldn't have prepared for what proves to be one of the most demented and legitimately scary stories in the whole series. We all love Tales from the Crypt for its fun popcorn horror stories that don't take themselves too seriously, but this is easily one of the best examples of how well they can do honestly haunting horror when they want to. Number 2. Easel Kill Ya Speaking of honestly haunting tales, this one follows Tim Roth as a struggling painter who proves to be one of the more sympathetic protags in the series, but also one of the most frightening ones. Not only is he having trouble finding buyers for his work as of late, but there's also the day-to-day -day personal struggle with his inner demons, like being a recovering alcoholic, and regularly experiencing vivid, disturbing, and violent fantasies about the people in his life. They never specify his exact condition, but it's clearly a much more serious and deep-seated problem than just the occasional passing dark thoughts that everyone has sometimes. After accidentally killing a drunk and obnoxious neighbor who he was just trying to quiet down, inspiration strikes our young artist, and he finds an unexpected outlet for the unsavory urges that prod at him, and solving his financial problems at the same time. Capturing the shock, terror, and lurid beauty of the moment of a murder in what turn out to be some of the best paintings he's ever created, and selling them to a very wealthy collector with that exact kind of taste. But just one or two of these masterpieces aren't going to be enough to satisfy his new best customer, played by William Atherton, who suggests that enough will never really be enough for the artist, either. Things only get more complicated and darker when the lady friend Roth has been growing close to lately finds out where he's been getting all his artistic inspiration from, and she does not take it well. In a series full of murders committed by one-dimensional cartoon characters out of greed, jealousy, spite, or even misguided self-righteousness once in a while. What really elevates this one for me is its harrowing themes of addiction, compulsion, desperation, and how they can lead genuinely tormented, down-on-their-luck misfits into dark, terrible places when they have nowhere else to go. And more tragic, scary, and real is how tempting those places can still be for such individuals. Even knowing full well all the reasons why they shouldn't, even when they're actively trying to turn back and be better, and especially when there's something they think may be worth making one last exception for, and then they'll stop cold turkey, pinky swear. I'm not trying to say it's a deep story particularly, but there is that uniquely chilling extra layer to it that really sticks with me. And while the ending is kind of predictable, in fact some might call it contrived even for this show, it nevertheless leaves a more emotional impact than most of these tales, and in doing so it becomes arguably one of the bleakest brings a whole new meaning to suffering for your art. 
Like any great anthology series, there are just too many good episodes to fit them all on this kind of list. So before we get to number one, here are a few more tantalizing tales of terror that just barely missed making my personal top 13. Morning mess. And all through the house comes the dawn. Forever amber green. The third pig. Abra. Cadaver. Death of some salesman. Lower birth. And my number one favorite episode of Tales from the Crypt is... Cutting Cards. There are, of course, plenty of other episodes both on and off this list that I could have easily put at number one if this was only about ranking the scariest or darkest episodes. But since most of us go to this show to have some morbid fun first and foremost, I ultimately decided to go with a purely and simply fun episode as my top pick. And Cutting Cards is perhaps one of the greatest examples of that black comedy and delicious overacting that Tales from the Crypt is so beloved for. Lance Henriksen and Kevin Tai play two rival gamblers whose egos and hopeless addiction to games of chance are matched only by their sheer burning hatred of each other. As they argue, spit venom at one another, and try to settle the score between them once and for all in a game of Russian roulette, Henriksen especially sells how much his character relishes both the exhilarating, increasingly deadly thrill of the game, and how intensely he just needs to outdo this guy he despises, come hell or high water. He not only insists on playing said Russian roulette game all the way to its logical conclusion, but is hilariously disappointed and pissed off when the bullet turns out to be a dud. Sure, he totally lucked out of painting the parking lot with his gray matter, but damn it, beating this guy the right way is more important. Ah well, nothing a stirring card game where they chop each other's fingers off every round can't settle, right? That uncompromising absurdity and go-hard-or-go-home attitude is the joy of watching this episode. Just how pettily, hatefully, and single-mindedly obsessed these two are with upholding their reputations and beating each other. How much they revel in making the other sweat, making them hurt, making them lose more and more until one of them surely has to be forced to say uncle, right? Right? A highlight of the series about two assholes whose massive desire to win ultimately pales in comparison to their need to see the other lose. I love the solid, simple premise... I love the cartoonishly demented performances, and I love the increasingly dark, violent, humorous execution that we the audience just can't help but enjoy more and more all the way to the end. Cutting Cards is just quintessential Tales from the Crypt goodness, and my personal favorite episode. Talk about not knowing when to cut your losses, eh? So those are my top 13 favorite episodes of Tales from the Crypt, one of the most iconic and mercilessly entertaining horror anthologies out there to this day. What did you guys think of my picks? What are your favorites? Let me know in the comments. I'm the Adorkable RJ. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and stuff if you are so inclined. And until next time, kitties, eat, drink, and be scary, for I witch you a happy, fantastic Halloween.